All right, it looks like we are ready to start the mayor and comptroller panel. Uh, yes, it looks like we have all of our participants. I'm very excited for this panel. Um, once again, I want to let people know my name is Amy Todorov. I'm the managing director for the League of Independent Theater. And again, for transparency, I want to recap that we did send a questionnaire to every candidate we could identify in every race. You can see who responded and who didn't respond in the surveys that have been linked in the chat. Please take a moment to find those surveys. They'll be linked throughout the event tonight. Based on those responses, we invited targeted candidates for, to participate in today's forum. We are th thrilled to have mayoral candidates, Catherine Garcia, Art Chang, and Sean Donovan here, as well as comptroller candidate, Brad Lander. Uh, candidates, thank you for spending your time with us. We're gonna take this first moment to introduce yourself, what district you're running in, and in five words or less, why you're in this race. We're gonna start with Art Chen. Oh, Art, I think you're on mute. That's great, okay. great manners. <laughs> great <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank, I'm so glad to be here. So I'm Art Chang. I'm running for mayor of New York City to rekindle joy, hope, and compassion. Beautiful. Catherine Garcia. Hi, I'm Catherine Hi. Garcia. I'm running for New York City mayor. And I'm running because there needs to be economic opportunity for every kid in the city of New York. And we need to have some fun again. <laughs> Sean Donovan. Sean Donovan running for mayor of New York City, and I'm the man with the plan right here, <laughs> including for theater. It's like 200 pages long. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of ideas. I, I it's a great doorstop. Hey, <laughs> jealousy, come on, people. Oh, this is gonna be a wild panel. Brad Lander, you better get in here. I'm Brad Lander. I'm running for New York City Comptroller to secure a just recovery for New York City. And I feel like something happened where there was a cross between ranked choice voting and those European like football leagues where you could be promoted or relegated. And I've been like promoted up to the Premier League for tonight. <laughs> this whole panel is Premier in my heart, but uh, let's dive right in. I'm gonna ask you uh, a question for all the panelists. You may have heard this before, but the rent is too damn high. So earlier we heard from Anamari de Casada, whose rent has gone up 125% in three years. We have an epidemic of empty storefronts across this city, while at the same time, our indie venues are being forced out of their spaces by increased rent and tax loopholes that prioritize empty storefronts over cultural space. Artists have no place to work, while venues like the Manhattan Theater Source have sat vacant for a decade. So. Right off the bat, just really quickly, raise your hand if you support commercial rent stabilization. Okay, can you see everyone's? All right, great. I'm, so, I'm even a co-sponsor of the bill, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I saw two hands up. So let's move right into longer questions. So going to Sean Donovan, based on your questionnaire, you say that you don't support commercial rent stabilization, but you're generally supportive of any policies that do help stabilize the rent. You just think there are better ideas. Can you tell us why you think commercial rent stabilization is the wrong way to port, support small businesses? And what are your other ideas, like your 15-minute plan that you showed us, that you think are better? You will have two minutes to respond. Well, I, I'm concerned that we need to focus our help for those who need it more, most. And whether it's the difference between our bigger commercial theaters and our small independent, independent theaters, whether it's our neighborhood shops versus big chains, I don't think we should be creating a benefit that goes to everyone. I think we ought to really focus on encouraging the small neighborhood-based restaurants and, and, and businesses that we need. And so I focused on things like Common Table, a program I created this past year to get our small restaurants, neighborhood-based restaurants, cooking emergency meals with funding uh, from philanthropy and ideally from the federal government. There are many, many other things that we can do to really focus the help to the people who need it most. Okay, great. Uh, Catherine, 
I noticed you also did not support commercial rent stabilization. Do you have uh, another plan in place? that you think could help small businesses? And also sort of a two-part question. Um, you are very familiar with a partnership between artists and government agencies like uh, Materials for the Arts. Mm -hmm. What other possibilities are you seeing there for partnership in uh, creating access to space or saving spaces if not commercial rent stabilization? So that's a great question. I have a long history, shockingly, at the Department of Sanitation of being very involved in arts and culture. Uh, we have had an artist in residence, Meryl Eucalese, for a decade. She had a huge retrospective at the Queens Museum, uh, as well as partnering with fashion designers uh, to create lines to promote textile recycling, and commercial chefs who have uh, really gotten on board on ensuring that there is less food waste. But I have a plan for small businesses that has multi-part. One is giving access to all of our open space so that we can engage again in things that we really enjoy. The second piece is eliminating the bureaucratic nonsense. I have proposed a one city permit so that you would know within 30 days that you were approved rather than going to eight agencies separately. Uh, the third piece is to create a micro lending program for small businesses to ensure that they can afford to stay where they are, because uh, we know that we need them to reopen. They are, they are the beating soul of New York City. Uh, and the last piece was to make it so that we are promoting New York City and finding all of the interesting creative places. If you've never been to Ridgewood, let's go check out Ridgewood. If you've never been uh, up to Arthur Avenue, if you've never been down uh, into Staten Island and gone to the Greenway. There are these beautiful gems across the city that we need to take advantage of as we wait for the rest of tourism to come back into this city. Uh, so I do have a multi-part plan to help ensure that small businesses are supported. Thank you. Art Chang, uh, you mentioned micro silos when discussing how government works. In two minutes, can you speak to us about your ideas to reframe our city government out of these micro silos and how could that improve the quality of life for indie artists in terms of space, but also in terms of the multifaceted issues that affect the quality of life for New York artists? Sure, well, well I'm gonna start with rent stabilization because that's a great place to, to be because rent stabilization by itself is a micro silo. We can think about commercial rent stabilization as going across every single type of business, but is actually, does it actually have to be that way? Right now we have nonprofits who are competing with for-profit companies for access to the same space in a time of rising commercial rents. And so for even for community spaces, designated community spaces, we've seen commercial operators and poor profit companies come in and take space away think, from places like nonprofit um, daycare centers and things like that. So we do need some, some form of, 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 of control over these things to keep them in their spaces. But in this time of COVID, you know, not only do theater companies and other types of performance space you know, need places to perform, we need places to rehearse. We have, and we have a record vacancy rate right now in our commercial spaces. We need an aggressive program to enable those spaces to be used for rehearsals and other things, potentially digital broadcasting of performances for audiences you know, all over the world. You know, we can do that and we can do it by working with the real estate industry, the commercial real estate owners, and by incentivizing through things like tax breaks. Um, and then, you know, getting to another thing, I just want to talk briefly about open culture and how we, this is a very, it's treated in a very much of a silo. I think it's a great program. Hats off to Jimmy Van Bramer for, for pioneering this. But this is done without the interaction of the arts community, without the engagement of the communities themselves, without the parks department, without the folks who actually run the open streets program. So when I talk about silos, we talk about these individual things that get done without the right coordination because everything in the city is integrated. Thank you, thank you. Um, wow, yes, uh, I'm gonna move over to Brad Lander now. Brad, you're up, time to, time to step in. Uh, 
The controller is essentially the city's chief financial officer and is a check on the powers of the mayor. How would you focus the power of the office of controller to improve quality of life for independent artists in New York City? It's a great question. I guess I also want to first just start by talking about why I support commercial rent stabilization, which was long before the pandemic. Um, you know, I have seen in my district independent theaters, studios, artists, nonprofits, and small businesses who invested an enormous amount, their life savings, money that they've crowdsourced. They make, uh, you know, significant investments in that space. All commercial rent stabilization says, like residential rent stabilization is next year. The rent can be a little more than this year, so your landlord can cover their rising costs, but they can't double it to boot you out because like a new bank branch is willing to pay twice as much as you are paying. So it's a pretty basic protection, and I think it's uh, essential. I proposed a model during the pandemic called small business recovery leases, which would just be a 10-year version of that entered into voluntarily between owners and tenants um, and covered with a 10-year tax break from the city to help make it possible. Those are the kind of proposals a controller can come up with. You do the research, you dig in on what's taking place in a sector of the economy. You say, hey, look, these independent theaters, our arts community are responsible for hundreds of thousands of jobs. We better do something to show up for them. Here's an economic idea, some way government can work better. One other critical area the controller has a particular relationship on is around contracting. Um, I know a lot of our arts organizations do get funding from the city for some range of programs through the CASA program, the council funds, after school work, arts education. Um, but too often we make those contracts take a year after you've even, you know, already started the work to get paid. We don't give you a decent indirect cost rate to cover the overhead costs. Um, and the controller has got a real responsibility to make those contracts get paid on time and make sure collectively that we recognize their full value so we could invest in our arts scene because that's what a just recovery will look like is a thriving New York City across all neighborhoods where people's creativity is what makes the city continue to grow and shine and thrive. Great, great. So we're gonna stick with you since you brought up a study. Developers very often offer community benefits in exchange for tax breaks or rights that they would not otherwise get without community consent. I'm sure you're aware of this practice. They promise cultural space, but once they get what they want, the cultural space doesn't materialize. Right now, there is no method of tracking or follow-up, so there is no accountability and no repercussions for a failure to deliver on these promises. How would you as controller hold developers accountable for the values that they are taking out of our communities when they promise benefits like cultural spaces and affordable housing, but then never deliver it? Do you have two minutes? Yeah, uh, no, this is a really important question because we have some programs that work really well. If you look at the artists and artisans that are in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, they're able to grow and thrive because they've got a mission driven owner but then if you look at some other programs like the 421A tax break, you know, Sean and I tried really hard to reform that 421A tax break a few times to make sure it would genuinely uh, provide affordable housing. And I just think the evidence is that program is not working. $1.7 billion a year we're giving away to for-profit private developers for overwhelmingly market rate housing. As a result of the way the rules got changed, there's not one unit being mandated by that program that's affordable enough for a homeless New Yorker to get an apartment. And in most neighborhoods in the city, you don't even have to offer what's essentially below market rent. That one I think just needs to be, and there's, there was just a study that showed 1500 landlords cheat even the most basic rent stabilization obligation. So that's a program I don't think could be fixed. It should be ended. Over time, we should use that $1.7 billion for programs that genuinely provide deeply affordable housing and space for artists. Um, you know, I think there are, one thing we've learned is if you're just gonna rely on the Department of City Planning as in the POPs program or in some kind of arts bonus spaces, they don't really have an enforcement arm. They could come out when you're building your building, but five, 10, 15 years after that building is built, there's nobody there to enforce. So a model I like a lot better for this is a stewardship model where that space is put under the guidance of a stewardship organization like um, uh, Spaceworks or Arts Gowanus or the Brooklyn Navy Yard who then enter into that lease. They have a mission and they're a mission-driven nonprofit and you can make sure that then there's an enforcement mechanism built in for the long-term so we really get the goods. 
I, um, I do just want to push yes or no. Would we conduct an audit to find those spaces that have been promised but that aren't being delivered on? Absolutely. Yes. Great. Yes. Yes, and I see hands up too from Catherine, Art, Sean. You want to put your hand up? Great. <laughs> so you have a consensus there. So uh, now we're going to shift into a very important video question from a community member, a good friend of mine. It's a difficult topic that our city must reckon with. So after this video, you'll each have two minutes to respond. Hi, I'm Angela. I am a mom of two kids and um, one of my children recently saw the footage uh, from the news about the shootings in uh, Atlanta. So my question is really about public messaging and what uh, you'll be doing to increase awareness about hate crimes and prevent hate crimes, um, as well as, you know, sometimes I, I've heard that people don't report hate crimes as such. So what kind of measures will you be enacting or hope to enact um, regarding this? Thank you. Great. Um, very brave question for Angela to ask. My heart goes out to her. Um, let's start with Catherine, your response to that. Absolutely. This has been a heartbreaking period for Asian Americans, but it's not new. It dates back more than 100 years in the United States. We need to do several things. You know, I have been standing up at rallies and candlelight visuals in Zoom meetings uh, and marches to support Asian Americans in New York City and that we must be loud and vocal against hate, we have to give the Asian American community safe spaces to report hate crimes and use their community-based organizations to do outreach uh, so that we really know where it's occurring so that we can ensure that there is a police presence on the street uh, so that they feel safe moving around. And there are horrible stories, not only coming out of Atlanta where, you know, People couldn't even call 911. They didn't understand them. Uh, we have to make sure there's language access for all of our residents. But we also need to do education uh, and ensure that the contributions of Asian Americans, but also uh, the Jewish community where we have seen a rise in anti-Semitism, but across the board and embed that into our history curriculum because the city of New York, you know, for the last 400 years has had every single ethnicity and religion here and all making contributions. They're not new immigrants. They have been here since our founding. Thank you. Uh, Art, uh, your response to that video. This has been a very tough week for me in the past couple couple weeks. Uh, this week and, you know, um, you know, just in conjunction with the protests this weekend and the rallies for peace, um, you know, a number of Asians were attacked. And I want to just point out a couple of things. Um, it's not just about Asians, it's also about women and the elderly. It's pinpointing some of the most vulnerable, but given the fact that so many of the perpetrators are men, there is an embedded and implicit connection between sort of the sexual discrimination and the, and the hatred that, that's coming out now. And in particular, I, the early news reports about the women in Atlanta trying to connect them to sex work, you know, it just sort of really amplifies this notion that, you know, that Asian women are connected to this exploitative hypersexualization that is not at all connected to who they are or what they do. And so there are some very, very deep rooted issues here that are multifaceted and interconnected that we have to be able to unwind. Um, other facts that people may not know um, that actually Asians who represent 15% of our city's population only receive 1.5% of our nonprofit services funded by the government. The fact that 15% of our population, um, we have the highest rate of poverty among our community of any ethnic group. And so we look at these things and you say, this is the cause, right? That these issues are all intertwined. And then for so many people who are 
who have moved to this country. I mean, my parents, I was born in 1963 in Jim Crow Atlanta. And this was before Asian immigration was legal, that when you have people who have fled a violence torn, war torn place, and they come to America, the reaction toward the police is not one of comfort. And because you couple that white look at the white man looking at the Asians and the Asian women, and it is not a it is not an equal setting. And so Asians do not want to report. I grew up in a domestic violence household The my mother never told the police what was going on. This is this is a problem that we have to correct across our, the, the, the world. And as I think as Catherine very rightly pointed out, heat is not just isolated to Asians. What we're seeing with Asians is amplifying hatred against Jewish people, against black people. And we've seen these waves of hatred come across this country. It is part of what this country is. Thank you. I really appreciate that our screen manager has hit the mute button. We I appreciate so much all you have to say, but we do need to give uh, Brad and Sean a chance to respond. So let's go to you, Sean. Thanks, Amy. And, and Art, I do want to say thank you for sharing uh, how difficult this has been and, and your personal stories uh, about your history. I've heard you talk about it before in these forums, and I think it's so powerful for you to step forward and share those um, with us. And just as powerful as, as the video that we saw. And for me, we have to have first and foremost, um, zero tolerance for hatred in our society. And this is something that every leader, whether it's a mayor, uh, every public leader needs to say loudly and clearly that we are a city for all. Uh, I'm the son of an immigrant. And I know that the city welcomed him in at times and didn't at others. And we must have a city that is open and welcoming to everyone, no matter what they look like, what language they speak. And that requires public officials to stand up and create real accountability. Uh, when I was housing secretary, I gave real teeth to the Fair Housing Act of 1968, so much so that when Donald Trump still had a Twitter account last year, he was attacking that work, saying that we were trying to destroy the suburbs because we were allowing people, no matter what they look like, what race, what language they spoke to live wherever they chose. And we need that kind of leadership, but we also need to go at the roots of this hatred and build bridges and bonds across uh, all the groups uh, in New York City. Uh, 30 years ago this year, I retraced the route of the Freedom Rides uh, with John Lewis and saw not only that it was black Americans coming together, it was white Americans, Asian Americans, Jewish Americans who joined to build a movement for rights. We need to build that movement here. And we need to find ways, particularly in the arts, to build those bridges. I have a close friend who started Brooklyn Ballet. And she goes into public schools across Brooklyn and combines cultural forms, uh, ballet and hip hop and so many different cultures. And Children through the arts, through performances, through poetry can deeply understand their own cultures and share those cultures in ways that break down stereotypes and begin to build those bonds. And that's something we have to do at this moment too. And so. Sorry, uh, out of time, but we are gonna get Brad's response to the video. Thank you very much, Amy. And I really appreciate the League of Independent Theaters asks this question. You might not think of it as a League of Independent Theater question. And the fact that you know it's a New York question and we have to build a city that's uh, safe for everyone is really critical. And, you know, Art, thank you for sharing. You know, I, I remember waking up after the Pittsburgh uh, massacre in the Tree of Life synagogue. And, you know, not that I hadn't seen plenty of anti Semitism before, but you just sit in a whole new way feeling vulnerable. And I think all of our hearts go out to. Uh, our Asian American uh, neighbors, and we have to show up better. I want to talk about one program that I think uh, I fought for in the past that was working, that got cut, and that I think can make a real difference here. It's called the Hate Violence Prevention Initiative. And actually, just this week, uh, Asian American Federation, Chinese American Planning Council, Muslim Community Network, New York City Anti Violence Project, and Jews for Racial and Economic Justice launched an effort to restore it. 
Two years ago, I was one of the allies who helped that coalition called NYC Against Hate win funding for grassroots community groups to take a, a prevention approach, education, community building, to interrupt violence through community-based upstander trainings, rapid response at the local level, build uh, partnerships across communities. Uh, we funded a dozen groups like some of the ones I mentioned. Unfortunately, that funding was cut last year by the speaker. It did not exist in this year's budget, but we're fighting to restore it. And I'll just give a quick example. I went out with that coalition with Desi's Rising Up and Moving that works with Bangladeshis and uh, Pakistanis and Indians and Jews for Racial and Economic Justice. And we walked around the streets of Kensington and Borough Park and one of the yeshiva leaders told me that the day before, a stink, some kids from the middle school had thrown stink bombs on the yeshiva bus. And you know, he wanted like, I think a much more aggressive you know, response. What we did though was followed up and we got some education programs in that middle school that started to build bonds between kids of, that, uh, of those communities. Um, we, you know, there are cases where you need a police response, but if what we're going to do is build communities, we need a, a, a an, an initiative like hate violence prevention initiative. I'll drop more information in the chat, and I hope folks will get involved in helping to fight for it this year. Great, thank you. Um, get, move just to a speed question. We're running out of time, but I want to get a little more juice out of this group. Um, if the city budget is a moral document, just in one or two words. What is the one way you will bring the budget in line with your morals? Brad, quickly, one or two words. One or two words, wow. Um, uh, mutual aid and solidarity and transforming our public safety response away from policing and towards supporting communities. Great, Catherine. It absolutely is a document that really reflects our values, but we also need to make sure we're getting the fundamental city services done right. You need to make sure that there is cleaning. You need to make sure that kids are getting back into school. And so it is about creating efficiency and not funding overhead, but funding the front line. Sean. Oh, you're muted. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you are right. Budgets are moral documents. I was President Obama's budget director over the $4 trillion federal budget and it must be a moral document. My two words are 15 minute neighborhoods. Uh, today, you can predict the life chances, even the life expectancy of a child growing up in New York by their zip code, and that has to end. And the way we end it is to reorient the way we plan our city to make sure that every child, every family has 15 minutes from their front door, everything they need to build a life of opportunity in this city. Great, art. One or two words. Reduce overhead, streamline services, deliver things faster and better so you can fund things like universal child care. Brilliant, brilliant. Now, our last question, uh, you'll have one minute to answer. Maybe we're gonna need that moment. Uh, New York City now has ranked choice voting for the primaries, which means voters will have the ability to rank multiple candidates that they support. You are no longer just running to be someone's first choice. How do you plan to make the most of this new reality? Or slash, who are your squad goals? Let's make this a very quick answer for everyone. Uh, let's start with Art. I'm looking for government and private sector experience. <laughs> Brad. Uh, you know, what ranked choice voting does is makes it necessary for you to campaign off all, all across all communities. You can't just pick your narrow lane and hope you're going to get to 40% plus one. If you're going to win a majority in New York City, then you have to be um, competing in black and brown and Asian and Latino and, you know, Jewish and Muslim and Christian and uh, all neighborhoods. That's a great thing about it. That's what we're doing. Um, and I look forward to continue. Great. Catherine. No, I, I agree with Brad on that one. It, you want to make sure that you are campaigning for your firsts and identifying those, but you need to make sure your people's second. And so it does mean you're running citywide. Thank you. And then Sean. It, I'll agree on that point. I think being able to reach every community is critical. But the other great thing about ranked choice is you need to run a more optimistic, visionary campaign because when you attack people in ranked choice, you might hurt them, but you actually start dropping down the rankings as well. 
Um, that's why I am the man with the plan. That's why I'm running, uh, with the biggest, boldest ideas for the future of the city uh, to present an optimism, optimistic vision of how we repair and rebuild, but also reimagine this as a city that works for everyone. So go to Sean for NYC and find out about that plan. Fantastic. Thank you all so much. I'm also going to encourage all of you to uh, drop your information in the chat so that people can check out your campaign. Uh, thank you again, panelists. I'm now